David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It's Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Time for another show. It is, what, day three now of the fascist guy's jury selection in his first criminal trial. It's a, it's a, it's a series of firsts. Of course, uh, on Monday, when things started, we found out by the end of the day that, uh, well, this was the first time that a former president of the United States had at any point ever fallen asleep during his own criminal trial. Of course, it was the first criminal trial of any former president, but uh, the first time that anybody ever fell asleep in court in front of everybody during their own criminal trial. But that's old news. Yesterday, the record was shattered as uh, Donald J. Trump, in case you forgot his middle initial, Donald J. Trump became the first former president of the United States ever, ever during his own criminal trial to have evidence entered upon the record, not in the trial, but during jury selection, during voir dire, that potential jurors had posted Facebook memes in which they had referred to Trump as, well, you know, dumb as F, which, you know, I mean, it's true. It it does seem like it took us a long time to get here. But, you know, we're a relatively young country in this grand scheme of things. So uh, you would have thought this might have happened earlier, but apparently not. So he's a record breaker. Uh, Congratulations to you. Uh, Ending up being quoted this way. Uh, One of the most brilliant trial tactics I've ever seen. I don't know whether anybody thought it ahead, thought it through ahead of time or uh, thought that the opportunity would present itself. But I I don't know. I mean, it wasn't that hard to imagine, but then it sort of unfolded as a surprise. Really, one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. One of the best days of court for Trump, from my perspective, that we've gotten to date. Of course, jury selection going on and during voir dire, uh, the the various, well, counsel from both sides are able to examine potential jurors and see if they uh, have any objection to their being seated on the panel, whether because they evidence some bias against their client or whether because they evidence some bias in general that simply won't be tolerated ordinarily by the courts or something. Any reason to conflict them off the jury panels that would conflict with their service as impartial jurors Okay, so we knew that was coming. But what we didn't know was that the geniuses of the defense were going to try to see people... Well, we did know that they would try to see people with anti-Trump biases bounced from the jury pool. Absolutely, they were definitely going to try and do that. What we didn't know was, or didn't think through, was that the judge was going to say, well, what do you mean? Well, this guy is, uh, we want to strike this uh, this juror for cause. And of course, there's unlimited numbers, usually, I don't know what the New York practice is, but usually unlimited numbers of, of uh, jurors that can be struck for cause. And then you have some uh, sort of discretionary, peremptory strikes that you don't necessarily have to demonstrate cause for. You just sort of get freebies, but a limited number of them. And so you want to use them strategically. The ones that you can prove have some demonstrable bias, you ordinarily get to strike without, uh, you know, without uh, having to account for them. But you do have to tell the court that's what you're doing, and the court has to agree that that's what you're doing. So you find yourself in this situation. We want to strike this juror for bias. Why is that? Well, Your Honor, you're very smart. We are very smart, of course. And we searched this person's social media presence and found evidence of that bias. What they didn't think through, I think was that the judge would say, how do you mean bias? Well, you know, they were saying terrible things about my client, Mr. Trump. Oh, they would say President Trump. Uh, but, they, I mean, did they not think that the judge was going to say, well, what things? Specifically, show me something 
or tell me something or read it to me or you, and if you're going to uh demonstrate you try to use it as evidence of bias you're going to have to show it to the prosecution show it of course uh to your to your client i guess you don't have to show it to your client but Anyway, so yesterday turned out to be the day that everybody got their mean tweets read directly into Donald Trump's face and into the, into the record of this trial proceeding. So really remarkable and uh, some great observations and some great things being read about him. One of the best observations being made that today, yesterday, was a big L loss for all the people who used to tut tut all of the, uh, what do we say, crap talking on social media. Well, you know, uh, you're wasting your time. I mean, I agree with the feeling and all, but Trump is never going to see that. So why are you wasting your time? People would tweet at him. I hate you. You're a big, dumb idiot. Uh, well, Trump's never going to read that. Trump's never going to see that. Why are you wasting your time? Well, we didn't know it would be read back to him as evidence during voir dire in his first criminal trial, did we? But now that we do... Uh, great. Everybody can turn up the volume. Uh, it was a fantastic discovery and a tremendous amount of fun. So mark that down on your calendar. And I guess it means it's going to happen in every trial that the former guy faces where there will be a jury impaneled. So uh, there's just going to be more. So now the more you come up with, if you're potentially, if you live in one of the jurisdictions where Donald Trump is going to be tried, uh, and you're in the jury pool and you think you'll probably be bounced from the jury anyway, and maybe you're not terribly interested in serving on the jury. Some people are, some people aren't, but maybe that's the best way to get out of it, and it's certainly cathartic. Why not spend your time posting uh, preferably obscene uh, attacks on the character of the former president of the United States, Donald J. Trump? You'll feel better about it. Uh, the world and the audience you have will feel better about it. And, you know, it may be permanently your birthday thereafter if you find out that your mean tweet was read into his face. They also, I noticed, they handed him a couple of printouts of these things and he examined them himself. It's fantastic. What a day. So I don't know. I don't know why we didn't. No one prepared. I didn't see Business Insider tell me to expect this. What great news. These legal experts don't know anything. They don't. They never tell you when somebody's going to be able to walk up to the former president of the United States and say, you're dumb as F, right to his face. Um, that seems like an event, in my view. Good morning to Greg Dworkin, who I'm sure also jo enjoyed this a great deal, but probably has some other news to discuss. How are you, Greg? I'm fine, and I did enjoy it. I, how could you not? You'd have to be, I don't know, dead. Not it's not by it. throwing a shoe at the president, but, you know, close. Yeah, you know, I mean, well, it's a little bit, well, this is more like flinging poo even, which is terrific, except for, you know, well, I hope you have a glove. Well, it reminds me of a story. Yes. Uh, but that's because most things remind me of a story. Well, yeah. So maybe 20 years ago almost, uh, when I was doing um, uh, emergency preparedness stuff on pandemic flu ah. and working with but never in the federal government. This was the Bush administration. How did we do on pandemics? Did we ever have any? Uh, well, uh, the work that we did for bird flu helped us when uh, Obama's swine flu thing came because there was a lot of stuff on the shelf that could be Im implemented right away. And then when COVID came, of course, it didn't work because it doesn't matter whether or not it's on the shelf ready to use. Trump can't read. Oh. And he president so the uh, initial response was awful so but that's one not for the story one, I was one for two tell. yeah so okay sorry the yeah. story i was going to tell is back in 2000 i want to say 2007 Think there about ahead. circa 2007 um i was approached by a very senior person at cdc back when it was respected hmm Yes. And asked Remember if I that? would consider throwing my hat in the ring for a spokesperson for them. Yeah. Well, I don't know why throwing a hat would help you, but okay. And I laughed. Me too. And, and I said, uh, that's silly. Um, there's this hat. thing called social media. We didn't have Twitter oh. then, but we still have blogs. Yes. I don't know if we called it social media, but I get you. And I said, uh, if you search any of the stuff I did, you don't want to deal with that. I know. I don't <laughs> want to deal with that. I said a lot of things at various and sundry times. I probably stand by all of it. But uh, that's not the point. I wouldn't be a juror. Get somebody else. Yeah. Okay. So you've been there, done that, and enjoyed it. Yeah. Good. 
I'd rather be in the position of telling them to their face. They're full of, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, I have the. Uh, that's but I the get stuff. it. Yeah. I, I totally understand the deal there. Absolutely. Uh, and the thing is, Trump you got to be was, careful. The thing about the trial, and I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on the trial today. It's been going to be going on for weeks. Uh, all right. Okay. But uh, jury selection is coming along fairly robustly. I'm surprised it's moving as fast as it is. I think they got seven out of uh, yeah. 18. 12 uh, plus 6 uh, alternates. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they're That's nearly quite, halfway quite done. Lot. They'll be done by the end of the week. Uh, slow down. Read more social media. And the trial starts. Mm. And that's right. sort of interesting. You know, People say that would interesting. be interesting. Yes. But uh, one of the things that has been debated, how much is this going to hurt Trump? Because he just uses it oh. for fundraising and nothing touches him <laughs> and all the other stuff is wrong. Okay. That people say. Right. Okay. Uh, Wrong, sir. Wrong. There you go. Exactly correct. Because what's happening here is that Trump is in the position, the best possible position for, uh, you know, anti-Trump people. Uh, He's not being thrown in jail, so he can't be hmm. martyred. Okay. I mean, I'm willing to try that. But he has to be in court when he doesn't want to be. Yeah. All day in a hot, smelly courtroom where he falls asleep. Yeah. And the judge periodically mm, admonishes him for things, mm -hmm. and he has to sit there and take it. Yeah. And the thing cool. that you have to understand about Trump is that everything about Trump, you know, we all know about his narcissism, mm -hmm. but he's a dominance guy. His whole shtick to his base, to his family, to himself especially, is I'm the dominant one. Mm, yes. I'm the alpha. And no, Judge Marshawn's the alpha. You have to sit there and take it. Yeah, it's yeah. killing him. That's funny. And it's great. And so you get the best of both possible worlds because this whole alpha thing is punctured by having to sit there and say, do you understand that if you do the next thing, I'm going to throw it? Yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that you're not allowed to do it? Yes, Your Honor. So he just has to sit there and take it. And it's wonderful. And it's uh -huh. happening. I'm, you know, I, I the only bad thing is it's not televised. Everybody can see it. But that's what's going on. And so one of the things that he was admonished about, uh, uh, to go with the theme that you had brought up here, is that one of the prospective jurors walked past him and he was reading something from his sheet. And it may well have been some of their social media stuff. <laughs> and he muttered at them. That That's the word that all the reporters used. He muttered something at the jurors. Then <laughs> Marshawn said, Sir, you can't do that <laughs> in my courtroom. I Even if this was a Wendy's. Forget it. You're yeah. not doing it. Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand if you keep doing this, they'll be saying, yes, Your Honor. I mutter, mutter, yes, Your Honor. And so, yeah, so this whole alpha thing gets punctured. And that, that to me, exciting. is what's exciting about the trial, you know. And so what kind of effect will it have politically? You're looking at it right there, folks. Hmm. Will the conviction matter? Sure, because that's going to be the headline, even if nobody pays attention to the minutia like jury selection. Yeah. Again, I was even surprised that Trump was there for this, but you know, maybe he has to be. I don't know. I don't uh, know. No, rules. apparently he does not have to be. He is opted to be, but then he wanted to get out of time. I don't know whether. But, they, he but thought... you know, Trump picks and chooses various things. Yeah. He wanted to get out of this so he could be at oral hearings for his uh, immunity stuff. But yeah. there's absolutely no rule that says you have to be there for oral hearings. No, not at all. That's just not required. I, I, you do have to be there for the trial, and the judge isn't going to let him out of that. Yeah. I don't know if why. If it's on a Wednesday and I'm otherwise busy because I think he does. Oh, right. It's Wednesday. You know, other other things, fine. Uh, but uh, if uh, we're done with the trial and it works, you can go to uh, uh, your son Barron's high school graduation the judge didn't ask, uh, when did you find out that <laughs> Baron was, was in, in high school? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, did somebody tell you that? Uh, or did you already know? Uh, he did. He, I, I, did I know he was in high school? No, Trump. <laughs> did Trump, Trump must have known that the kid was around somewhere, Yeah, whether he knew he was in high school. He was in it, school, but did he yeah. know which school? Oh, I don't know. Probably not. It's a brand new school. Do you know what grade he's in? Do you know how he's made doing? Do you know anything about him? Uh, no. Do you know well, what probably he looks not. like? Uh, oh, uh, he's like a basketball player sized. Yeah, exactly. I know that. He's like 6'9". That's incredible. 120 pounds. Well, good. You know, Stay healthy, out, kid. But, you know, that, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, anyway, uh, he's trying to use Barron's uh, high school graduation yeah. as an excuse 
And the other question on but the table what? that uh, social media asked is, yeah. how many of the other kids' graduations in <laughs> high school did you actually go to? I don't know. I bought the high schools. Mm. I have no idea. Yeah, everyone says that uh, he hasn't gone or that there's no pictures. I mean, AI can generate some. Right, but the thing is, all of this gets fingers. exposed. And again, so that's why it has a cumulative effect. Now, what yes. kind of effect is it yes. having up until now? It's hard to know, but this was interesting. All right. Uh, and this is? There is a Republican pollster, Patrick Graffini, who's oh. also a very uh, prominent Republican activist with a big mouth. Yes. Uh, yeah. And he runs a uh, shop called Echelon Insights. Oh, I don't think I knew the name of it, but okay. Thank you. And a national poll out yesterday. Mm-hmm. Biden gained two points, so he's now at 49. Trump lost three points. He's now at 46. It's a five-point shift. 46. Okay. It's last month. Hmm. So it's 49, 46. If you add RFK in the mix, Biden's 41, Trump is 40. Again, Biden gains a point, Trump loses three. RFK is at uh, 11. That's uh, radical F and K, according to <laughs> right, Donald right. Trump. You can see now why. Uh, Cornell West and Jill Stein are tied at two. Uh, great. For there was uh, a guy yes, running in the Democratic primary against Biden, whose name I already forgot who was uh, uh, contesting with Jill Stein to see who would finish last in each one of the primaries. I mean, the actual Democrat, Phillips? Yeah, yeah. Dean, Phillips, Dean Phillips. Dean Phillips. Okay, all right. He, he is a Democrat. So He's right. now West and Stein are doing the who's going to be lower, Stein or West. Hmm. And so, uh, again, Steiner, I expect RFK Steiner. to be in that territory by the time things come because there's stories circulating now about how the entire Kennedy clan hmm. uh, went after him. It's got nothing to do with us. Sure, and you know... They don't have a lot of pressing engagements, those guys. Well, the thing is, high information voters already know what's going on. It's the low information voters who are going to find out that, oh, Trump is accused of something. Oh, it's a criminal indictment. Hmm. Oh, he's on trial. Oh, he's losing. Oh, losing. <laughs> oh, he's been convicted. He's dumb as what? This is what's Ute? going on now. What happens when those low information voters actually find out some of this stuff? Wrong. And by that, they will, because that kind of stuff actually, uh, you know, circulates. Yeah. And and this is some of the lowest information available. Yeah, exactly. So right. It's perfect for them. So, you know, that's what's going on now. And then comes the trial. And uh, there's, there's no question that Biden has made some progress over the last month in terms of polling. Now, it's true that it's too early to, to pay too much attention to polling. It's true that uh, when you're uh, biased, you look mm-hmm. at something, somebody pointed, I guess it was a G. Elliot Morris, and it actually made me laugh. He said, when Trump is up four points in the poll, it's within the margin of error and the polling is too early. Yeah. When yeah. Biden is up by one, oh, look at the change. That's incredible. Hmm. Well, no, I mean, they're both true. Okay. It's still too early, and that's well within the margin of error. It's a close election, has been all along. One could argue there's been no change whatsoever. But the vibes have changed. We know that from Mm -hmm. the betting markets, who now have Biden ahead as the most likely to win. All right. And again, what's really fun, in fact, there was this whole big story. I think Jonathan Martin wrote it for Politico. Mm. Okay. About how, well, you know, with the cocktail parties, people are starting to adjust to the fact that, okay, Trump isn't the lock. How are we going to deal with this? Uh, <laughs> and and I, I laughed and said, of course, ah, it's Jonathan see? Martin and his Politico. And the entire basis of the Washington press is that Republicans are the natural people should be leading Washington. And anything that interferes with that is a story that has to be told from the Republican perspective. Hmm. And that, that's just, yeah. as Walter no, Cronkite no, used to that say, way. that's just the way it is. Yes, or that's as you say. Bullshit. That's bullshit. Of course it is. You know, here, here's the New York Times this morning on, on their uh, landing page, the web page. First story, analysis. Mike Johnson needs Democrats in Ukraine handing them power to shape aid plan. The next one, Speaker Mike Johnson's plan for Israel and Ukraine met pushback from Republicans muddying its path. Uh. Look, <laughs> this is a bunch of of incompetent, Mm -hmm. totally divided Republicans who do not know how to govern and can't do anything. And Mike Johnson leads them, but he leads them in those categories, too. Uh. And the whole framing here is 
Johnson has such a difficult job. I don't know how he's going to pull. He can't pull this off. Hmm. This is a ridiculous frame to begin with. In, in fact, uh, Democrats have more power now in the minority than I in, yeah. in my lifetime. I can remember the minority party having in the it's House. It's never been, never been like this. And uh, we may wind up with Speaker Jeffrey sooner than later. Yeah. So all Maybe of the stories this morning, and this is going to be important when we talk about the overall election stuff. But the overall story this morning, for example, Punchbowl uh, has two major stories. Washington and the world wait on Johnson's move. He still hasn't come out with exactly what he's going to do. People okay. on his side are getting frustrated because instead of just saying this is what I'm going to do and then doing it, he's still meeting with hardliners and uh, he's trying to appease them and assuage their concerns. And how does that work out from a practical point of view? He's got to get what he wants to do, which is breaking up Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan into different bills, but packaging them together with a single rule. Mm. That means he has to get through rules. And remember, <laughs> we've said yeah. this back when Kevin McCarthy was doomed yeah. by winning. We said, you gave away the rules committee. You gave away the speaker's committee. How can you possibly function? And here it is. So now he's got to pass this rule. And there are hardliners on that committee who don't want to pass it. So the only way it passes is if Democrats vote yes on the rule, and that's unheard of. Right. Or they go around it and do a suspension of the rules and do it with, you know, uh, what is two it? Two thirds. thirds, three quarters, yes. nine tenths, whatever it takes, you know, to get this thing passed. Hmm. Or, uh, and there are GOP people saying this, we're sick of this, they say to the reporters. We are so freaking tired of this. If he can't get this rule passed, we're doing the discharge thing. We're doing the discharge petition. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do uh, challenge the previous question, however that's phrased properly. We're going to do discharge. We're ready. Okay. It's one or the other. we got to get this done by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you frame that as Mike Johnson looking for a pet. Mike Johnson is screwed. The yeah. Republicans are screwed on this. Okay. And the question is how it's going to fall out. We don't know yet. It's an uh, interesting time, certainly. I mean, we, we're we already down the path that these things have never happened before, and uh, this never happens. This is unprecedented. So you might as well throw a discharge petition in there, too, because that's really never succeeded. Uh, so fine, or it's been many decades since it has, anyway. Uh, and, right, that's and the thing, and that's an, an important point. And thank you for bringing it up. Need. A lot of oh, the stuff that people say this never happens something. actually has happened. It's just that it hasn't that's happened true. in the past couple of 20 years. Oh, well, we've experienced that before. Uh, you know, changing filibuster rules with a simple majority. Okay, uh, you can do that. What? No, we can't. Yes, you did. In fact, you actually voted for that once 25 years ago. Right. Uh, what? There's a draconian bill on the border, H.R. 2, that has no chance of passing. And okay. the hardliners are holding right. out. Well, we won't do a Ukraine aid until you attach this. Or maybe Didn't you'll hear the refrain, we won't pass foreign aid unless you attach uh, border security. But that was done in the Senate, and they refused it. So it's hmm. – you ready for it? Oh, yeah. It's it's bullshit. That's bullshit. Exactly. There you Alrighty, go. Okay. I can just so, play it for you. So, uh, you know, we don't know. So that's really what's taking so long. You get uh, press. You get coverage. If you say things like, oh, I'm Thomas Massey from Kentucky and I'm going to join Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene in uh, suggesting that Johnson resign. And if he does this uh, Ukraine thing, that I'm going to join her with a motion to vacate. That doesn't mean anything. OK. I you have only need a motion to vacate and you have to make it a privileged thing. Yeah. And you only need one person right. for that. So a second person joining it is pretty useless. Uh yeah, that's – I mean that's true. There's, there was nothing to it. It just – he's announcing his support for it. Yeah, we kind of knew that. The way you said that made me think of the three toddlers in a trench coat. I'm Thomas Messi. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wobbling around. No, Mike Johnson's on top. I'm Speaker of the House. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm thinking of those car dealership And he's standing on Thomas well. Massey and then Marjorie Taylor Greene's on the bottom. <laughs> well, she does a lot of exercise and squats, so she can hold the, the pile up. So uh, as Punchbowl puts it, Johnson now finds himself slipping into an old habit that infuriates his leadership colleagues and senior Republicans. He's mm. taking meetings with all comers in the GOP conference. Well, and to some inside the Republican leadership, Johnson started with a solid offer. And now he's undermining his own position. 
He's negotiating with conservatives who will never vote for the proposal, no matter what. Mm. The House Freedom Caucus is bloated adding H.R. 2. It's a non-starter. None of it will work. Democratic leaders in the White House won't support it, making it unlikely Johnson can pass a rule or the bill. And so if a Republican is pressing to add H.R. 2, what they're really doing is pressing to kill it. It's a poison bill. Okay. Terrific. <clears throat> Johnson, Let him do it. Democrats want Johnson just to release the bill. Oh, there's also this 72-hour rule, which I think is made up. Wow. And, that, like if you say yeah. something, you need three days before you can vote on it. But if he does that, that'll put it into Saturday, and the House wants to get back to campaigning. So they're not yeah. happy with that. So nobody really knows what's there. going on there. My point in telling you all of this is, is not to predict what's going to happen in regard to passage. Nobody really knows. But likely whatever will happen will be because Democrats do, in fact, have more power than the minority has in our lifetimes. Hmm. The point I'm trying to make is when it comes to the general election. Yes. And I'll go into this in detail after the break by looking at Arizona. Hmm. You will hear people say, well, the GOP will never do this and they'll never do that. And they were united monolith. <laughs> and look, look at the house. Come oh, on. Oh, oh. Yeah. No, look I know. At how it's the a, house is a great opening. There's nothing monolithic about the GOP these days. No. Look at the parties in the individual states, like Michigan, which we've talked about at length. And we're going to do Arizona after the break. All right. And the fact of the matter is that whether it's uh, Alabama trying to respond to IVF or yes. whether it's Arizona trying to respond to a pre it was a state law about abortion. The GOP doesn't know what to do, and they are fighting amongst themselves. And you know what it, what Lincoln said about a house divided, according uh, to the internet. Yes, I have he heard said, "Don't believe thing. anything you read on the internet, <laughs> even if it is in a divided house." Okay, well, uh, take care of that smoke alarm. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the kegger in the morning show here on netroots radio somewhere i think uh, in the background it could be could be in my house could be anywhere could could be something i'm in, i'm imagining could be a strange new species of bird sounds like there's a nine volt battery running low somewhere and a smoke alarm but uh, this is real life <laughs> Could be Arizona. AI. A Could be about what's going on with the Republicans. Right, here. they're on fire, and where there's smoke, as you know, well, really, all there's you know Trump is that trial. there's smoke. Quite honestly, <laughs> yes, that's because true. Because there's a Trump trial everywhere, so you know. That's right. It's an assumption on your true. part that it's fire, uh, but you need to build a foundation for that before you introduce it. I say where there's smoke, there's smoke. Okay, that's the actual. That's the standard of proof for real. You've established that there's smoke. That's all. Jury's entitled to make an inference, but all right. Uh, so what else is going on besides what? What was well, going on? Well, there's a bunch of stuff about? going on. You know, there's stuff that I'm simply not uh, yeah. uh, privy to Doing. or qualified to understand. Oh, okay. uh, for example, the Supreme Court talked about whether uh, or not you can try to indict January 6th people on the basis of interfering with a government process. Sure, go ahead. 
Thanks. and whether that counts as uh, you know legitimate. And uh, there are some concerns. Again, you know, as a non-lawyer stepping back, if it weren't political and if it weren't this Supreme Court, and if you trusted them, right, all of which are big ifs, which aren't true, but. If all of that were true, you'd step yeah. back and say, I understand some of the concerns about this because you don't want to apply it to any old uh, political gathering. Right. You don't want to make it overly sure. broad, in other words. That's right. So I and would say. the answer say, to that is, well, you know, usually what happens is you um, don't try to hang Mike Pence. Right. So ah, perhaps the answer to that is, well, anytime you try to hang Mike Pence, no, it's it's yeah. okay to do this. Well, no, I don't know if that uh, if that gallows was really. All right. Well, let's say what if we drew the line at smashing into windows and smearing feces all over the wall of a public and stealing property? Yeah. And t carrying away and flags carrying and lecterns and, and using weapons, punching and, cops uh, and hurting police. Yeah. Like if that was what if, if that's that was the standard. bottom line? Well, uh, in that case, when you put it that way, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, you know, and, and uh, so let me have your answer, Your Honor. Said, look, if you look at the actual text, it says otherwise impeding or obstructing. You know, hmm. if you're a textualist, as you claim you yeah. are, which we know All you're right, not, right. then read it that way. Yes. And of course, they're going to say, no, we have these other concerns. You know, again, because There's the Supreme a way to Court get is a, uh, a club mm -hmm. that basically figures out what they want and then they try to figure out how the law applies to it right i'm not a lawyer but i know what that's that's what they're doing and, and if you're a lawyer and claim otherwise you don't know what you're talking about right. even when they don't eventually sometimes come around to that uh the the supreme court is like what do we say about the senate the uh, uh, world's greatest debating society the supreme court is the world's greatest just asking questions society yeah. You know, in any I, case. What about so, if? So there's that. And I don't know how that's going to turn out. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, but most of the people who were indicted were indicted on other charges as well. Uh, so Casey's it makes smearing. for a big news splash. But I don't know what kind of practical impact it has. Uh, Same with Trump. I mean, he's indicted impact. on other stuff besides this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know if they decide that, whether it applies to Trump. So, hmm. you know, I, I'm noting it, but I don't know what it means. OK. Yeah. Noted, as they say, in court. So noted. Right. Now, we're talking about the dysfunction in the Republican House of Representatives okay. in Congress yes, in Washington, D.C. But this That's story right from the subheader Magaville <laughs> comes from Marco Puto. Marco Puto. Where he now works. Oh, Caputo. Right. Okay. Caputo, that the guy, guy that knows everything yeah. about Florida. <laughs> He's writing okay. about Arizona. Yes. Oh, well, they're both warm. And he writes the A word. And by that, he doesn't mean Arizona. Oh. He means abortion. Arizona Republicans oh. have an abortion problem and a Trump problem. And the quote that he used in the title, these small town oh. lawmakers need to get with the program or their career is going to wind up in the trunk of a car. Ooh. Wow. They don't sleep with fishes in Arizona. because It's a no really fishes. fascinating look at what's going on in the Republican Party. And the gist of it, the bottom line, is there are some hardcore mm. anti-abortion activists. Yes. Kathy Herod is mentioned specifically. Who the hardline MAGA Republicans in the Arizona legislature, who only have like a, a one vote majority, are terrified of. And oh. they are more afraid of their own homegrown local nutcases than they are of Trump. Mm. OK, hmm. so Arizona's GOP has an abortion problem, and that means Donald Trump has an Arizona problem. Ah. Last Friday, following the Arizona Supreme Court's reinstatement of an 1864 law. Remember, it didn't become a state till 1912. Uh, criminalizing abortion, Trump called on the Republicans who control the legislature to strike down the statute. Strike it down and I will become stronger than you know, <laughs> I the Star Wars. <laughs> right. Yes. The Supreme Court in Arizona went too far in their abortion ruling enacting and approving an inappropriate law from 1864, Trump wrote on Truth Social. Sure, why not? So you would think that if Trump truly controls the mm, GOP and it's no, a monolith, false, as some people false, claim, uh, that therefore yeah. they would say, okay, well, let's get rid of it. But they're not getting rid of it. And they're not getting rid of it because they're more afraid of their anti-abortion local activists than they are of yeah. Trump. Well, those guys are bomb makers. Arizona Republicans have a one-seat majority in the State House and Senate. The overwhelming majority of the GOP caucus is either in favor of the 1864 law 
or fear changing it would incur the wrath of social conservatives led by Kathy Herod. Kathy the president Herod. of the Center for Arizona mm. Policy, Herod, called on mm. legislators to keep the 160-year-old law intact, make good on the promises they made in 2022. And today, in a test of Trump's influence, the Arizona House convenes and may take up the law to repeal it. A similar effort wow. failed Wednesday before Trump issued his directive. Okay. Who are Republicans and the legislator more scared of? Kathy Herod, says Chuck Coughlin, mm. a former Arizona Republican legislator and consultant with High Point. That's capitalized, so it must be a firm. Okay. She has a lot of influence. She's everywhere in the state capitol. She pays attention. She's done this for decades, and you don't cross her. Uh, and even right. allies allied with Trump we'll are see. bucking him. They're whining him? Bucking. I B-E-U-C-K. see. B-E-U-C-K. What? Like a uh, bucking bronco. <laughs> Did you say ute? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, one Republican who could be of help to Trump is Arizona House Speaker Ben Toma. So the Speaker of the House in ben Arizona, Toma. who has some influence on what happens there. <laughs> yeah. And what legislation comes to the floor? Ah. Uh, he doesn't like Trump because Trump endorsed oh. his opponent. Who's his oh. opponent running for Congress? Uh, he's going to leave the Arizona speakership there, and he's going to run for Congress. And who is he running against in the Republican primary? Uh, a fellow named Hitler. Abe Hamada. It, okay. Abe Hamada is a well-known oh, yeah. right-wing nut job right. who Didn't lost he... the Secretary of State race by That's 280 it. votes. That's and then challenged right. it 17 times and lost all, all 17 or whatever. He's got 200 At least five. I, I don't know if he got to 17, but he was trying. Yeah. Uh, so Trump endorsed Hamada over Toma. Toma doesn't like Trump. And Toma may not help Trump out by repealing this law. Which okay. would only screw the Republicans <laughs> in Arizona. <laughs> I don't know who to root for. There's going to Everybody be gets a, uh, a ballot initiative this November about enshrining abortion rights in Arizona. Hmm. To the point where other people in Arizona, like Carrie Lake, understand this. She's embraced Trump's position. Last week, she reversed her support for the territorial abortion law. And <laughs> she's been lobbying legislative leaders and social conservatives in an attempt to persuade them to eliminate the old law, which they don't want to do because they're not cases. Awesome. She wants to this do it good. because, you know, I think we talked about the rule about exceptions. There should always be three exceptions for yeah, right. uh, banning abortions. There should be uh, saving the life of the mother. There should be rape and incest. And there should be uh, my poll numbers are dropping. Those yeah. are the three exceptions. <laughs> uh, and they're entitled to them. Right. And so, you know, Carrie Lake is what is the third exception here. Hmm. You know, she was uh, for this law until she's against it. Yeah. So. All right. We'll see how they deal with this. This is fantastic dynamics. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's incredible dynamics. Trump's pollster, Tony Fabrizio, says Democrats are over-focused on abortion. Have you heard this one before? Uh, yeah. In a polling memo released Monday, Fabrizio's data showed Arizona voters overall aren't preoccupied with abortion. But for all its confidence, the Fabrizio memo was released to quell panicking Republicans in the state. Hmm. The memo was to stop the bedwetting. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, let's go. Uh, is it just let's see what happens. Wedding. Barrett Marson, an Arizona Republican political consultant, said the shift in political winds has been notable. He's talking about vibes here. Mm. There's a vibe shift in Arizona. Can you believe it? Yeah. Well, it's confusing. No wonder. This is right. really something. Yeah. Before the Supreme Court, the issues were immigration, the economy, and after it's abortion, abortion, and also, oh, by the way, abortion. And mm. did I mention abortion? Yes, you did. And uh, you could see it in working. Carrie Lake. You could see it in the chaos in the Republican ranks. Remember, Trump's a chaos agent. Yes, that's true. You do say that a lot. And uh, there's fatigue with Trumpism. What's changed for the professional suburban woman in Maricopa County to make her vote for Trump since 2020, said mm -hmm. one of the consultants. He's not expanding his appeal. I'm not sure anybody believes in flip-flopping on abortion anyway. That's true, too. Former U.S. Representative Matt Salmon, a Republican who unsuccessfully ran against Lake for governor in 2022 yes, and earned that. Trump's ire for refusing to endorse his stolen election lie, said he wouldn't be surprised if Democrats ultimately decided not to help undo the 1864 abortion ban mm. because there's no incentive for Democrats to help bail Republicans out. This is spoken well, like a true Republican. Yeah. Right. I don't stand for anything except power. And so having this law on the books seems to help Democratic turnout in November. 
therefore we shouldn't do anything. And Democrats say, it's hurting people. We have to get this off the books. Yeah. And Salman, the Republican, says, I don't understand what you're saying. You're using words, but they don't mean anything to me. <laughs> I, did you say you were going to – did you say ute? No, I said going to help people. Oh, all right. I didn't know what that word meant. So it, it's incredible. And, and so you see you know, right here before you in stark terms hmm. – uh, not John Stark, he used to play for the Knicks, but like in stark terms, yes. you see the difference between the parties. The yeah. Democrats are attempting to govern and trying to help people. And Republicans are looking at this and saying, how does it help me personally? Otherwise, who cares? Yeah, they don't understand any other, any now, this, other way of looking you know, at it. This is just a it's fascinating so look. Abortion is not merely a state's right issue without the Supreme Court ruling in Roe. It's an issue for every level of government. A uh, student for life action president, Kristen Hawkins, said in an email, in other words, don't give me this BS about states' uh, rights. Yeah. You Republicans need to push an anti-abortion law at the federal level. Hmm. So don't weasel out, says one group of, you know, uh, anti-abortion national people. Another national leader, however, told the bulwark on condition of anonymity that evangelical voters have nowhere to go but Trump, so picking Biden is a non-starter. We know Trump. We trusted Trump. He got Roe repealed. On the other hand, this law is too harsh. We lose too much with it in November. The presidency, hmm. a Senate seat, the legislator here, legislature here in Arizona. The fact is these small-town lawmakers need to get with the program or their career is going to wind up in the trunk of a car. It's finished. Hmm. So... In other words, Republicans nationally, even those who are uh, fully committed anti-abortionists, uh, anti-choice people, yeah, totally understand they're getting screwed with this. And they're making the professional decision that maybe we should lighten up because it's killing us politically. And another <laughs> right. faction are saying, I don't care. Right. No. Right. Abortion is murder. And I don't care if it's killing us politically because that kind of, you know, killing is OK. What's uh -huh. not OK is, you know, IVF. And so, <laughs> again, when you tell me that the Republican Party is a monolith who will do whatever Trump says, I look at the House and say, no. Mm -hmm. I look at the Arizona situation here and say, no. And why should it be true anywhere? Mm -hmm. It's not. They're Their not monoliths. Interests uh, occasionally and, align. But and so if you're if you're talking it. about, well, you know, 90 percent of them are going to vote for Trump. No, they're not. Well, according to polls, 97% of uh, his voters are behind him. Yeah, yeah well, well yeah. lose 3% and all of a sudden it's a landslide. Yeah. Well, that's oh, true, and, too. And let me whisper this. Hey, maybe the polls are wrong. Oh, well. Maybe no the only people answering that. polls yeah. are people who really like him and want you to know that they like him. Yeah. Well, there is that, and uh, I think everybody can appreciate that as a possibility but yeah you know and then of course they say well you say they weren't a monolith and yet here they had a vote and there was a party line vote occasionally they they are actually frequently they do understand that it pays to stick together but they are functionally at one another's throats all the time now what we see again the reason i wanted to talk about mike johnson before i talked about arizona is you have to go back to what we do understand at a gut level here, mm -hmm. at a visceral level, is that in the National House of Representatives yeah. in D.C., Republicans have the majority, but they don't have a functional majority. Yeah, well, They well, can't get anything majority. done. They can't even get a goddamn rule passed. That's, yeah. I mean, that's the most obvious and most blatant evidence of... Uh, not say, functioning so, as a monolith. You and I told you so. Yeah. This was going to happen. We told you the day that vote happened. And we heard that the price for McCarthy to win was giving up the Speaker's Committee. Mm -hmm. And we looked at each other, uh, metaphorically speaking, because like, uh, I don't yes, have a video I here, the and said, oh, my God. Hmm. Do you know what this means? Yeah. And I'm, you said, yeah, I do know what this means. That, this is like, lose unprecedented. Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, there was an ad there's an additional step there that – that I don't think we were explicit in, but I think has now been explained quite clearly, is that the the mechanism of control that they gave up, the Rules Committee, is a very large part of what makes an otherwise fractious party look monolithic. 
So the tools that they had to, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes and pretend to continue to be in step and monolithic were eliminated. So it was only a matter of time before people who really understood what was going on and were watching closely would be able to tell you, yeah, uh, though there's usually lockstep procedure here, uh, as you see, things that require a lockstep uh, are are not happening. And and they never really did, I, I suppose. I guess if you had a 15-seat margin, uh, it looks like lockstep if you pass everything but lose 14 votes. But the problem is when you don't have that to spare, you start to see what lockstep really means and that it's not really happening. Yeah. So right. in other words, Nancy Pelosi in a similar mm. margin mm. made it look like the Democrats were united. We know that's not true because we know the Democrats. Yeah. It's just, well, if you have some skills right. and you negotiate, I mean, Dean Phillips you can make and the it squad work. were not necessarily on the same page here. No. But they Nancy Pelosi made it look like they were because she knew how to, you know, uh, get stuff done. Yeah. Those nasty compromises would sometimes be offered and everyone would say, mm, okay, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I can do and that. Whoever replaced him, who I don't even remember anymore, and whoever replaced him, or I don't even, you know, right. uh, Patrick McHenry as an interim, oh, yeah, right. whoever replaced him. Uh, right. Doesn't yeah, it, uh, and none of them have been able to make it work. Yeah, well, uh, so now they may do another motion to vacate the chair. It's unclear what everybody's going to do and who needs to save who and for what price. But, you know, one offer we could make to Johnson, if he's looking to Democrats to save him this time, it, it's possible. I don't think they'll ever be issued orders to do it. No right. one would follow those orders. But right. so... Uh, you know, uh, we we know in idea. the House there's no functional Republican majority because they can't get anything done. Mm -hmm. The question in the House in uh, Arizona is going to be, do they have a functional Republican majority? Because if people are calling for this law to be repealed and they can't do it, they're going to get killed in November and they know it. Oh, well, and some know. of them don't care. What can you do? Yeah. They'd rather be right and in the minority, and that's true in the National House as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how does this all play out in terms of whose side do you want? No, I'm not saying that this is going to make any of them vote for Biden. But again, the voters who care about this stuff, some of them may well stay home or write in somebody else mm -hmm. or do the John Bolton thing. I voted for Jake Cheney last time. I'll vote for him again. Well, mm -hmm. who cares? Well, the only point is you're not voting for Trump, so fine, take it. Guess so. Your opinion doesn't matter to me otherwise, but I'm glad to hear you're not voting for Trump. Uh, we could use a few more people who don't vote for Trump. Mm. Not everybody has to vote for Biden. Just don't vote for Trump. That's that's the key. Some people will never be persuaded. Just, okay, well, what about what about not voting for him? Okay. Fine. All right. Vote for gotcha. Vote for Plankton. Mm. Okay. Other things that are happening at the same time, not only is Trump in court feeding all of this, feeding all of this mm -hmm. dissension, mm -hmm. feeding all of this angst, Ooh. feeding all of this chaos. I love Here's feeding. a New York Times story. Prosecutions of fake electors for Trump gain ground in swing states. Georgia, Yay. Michigan, and Nevada have already brought charges against right. people who pose as electors for Donald Trump. Arizona and Wisconsin have active investigations. Active. They're acting towards it. So some of these uh, state... Uh, trials don't yeah. get Aileen Cannon. They don't get the ability to put them off. Mm. Some of them might, in fact, be televised. Ooh. It all matters. Good. It's about time. I Yeah, it's really been disturbing how long it takes to... Th this is just well, such a fundamental crime against the Constitution. I can't believe it's taken so long. But I guess they're being careful. Right. Again, a reminder, the chairman Urgh. of the Nevada Republican Party has been indicted. The former yeah. chairwoman of the Georgia right. GOP has been indicted. Right. A former co-chairwoman in Michigan is facing charges. So it's not just Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, it was bound to happen mostly because of the kinds of people they ordinarily make or try to make electors legitimately. Uh, right. So <laughs> the state party head is almost always going to be caught up in that. Right. And so since we're on the theme of GOP division, mm -hmm. and by the way, in each one of those states, the GOP uh, local party is divided over what to do about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, including the one in Michigan that we heard for so long 
were meeting they in parallel. Decide who was running the place? And, and who I'm had the, the no. Who I had am. the keys to the front door of the headquarters? Right. Big lawsuits over that. All right. Cool. Right. Hope it spreads. So while all of that's happening, let's throw in one more piece of GOP hmm. divisions. All right. Let GOP in disarray. Yay. And that is uh, in the Senate. Why? Why? Uh, because, as you uh, mentioned the other day, Alejandro Mayorkas yes. is up for impeachment. They finally did walk over ah, no, uh, the articles of impeachment. No Chris coverage. Murphy this morning on TV said we all in the Senate tried to keep a straight face as they read them. <laughs> uh, and it was just about impossible to do because they were so dumb. Yeah. But then what happens now? What does happen now? Well, today... They're going to discuss what to do about it. The, mm. the Democrats are going to dismiss the charges, but the question is going to be how. Yeah. They were working on a time agreement mm. that would have allowed 90 minutes of debate ahead of votes on two Republican motions, one to establish a full trial, another to create a trial committee. Both of them would have, uh, you know, dismissed by the yeah. Democrats. They wouldn't pass. The deal would have then allowed Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to move to dismiss both impeachment articles. Mm -hmm. However, yes. they couldn't agree to it. You know why? Because the GOP was divided on whether that's what they really wanted. Huh? What's what, next? What says Punch Bowl, the rejection of any time agreement sets the stage for a likely conservative revolt on the Senate floor. So Republicans are expected to make num innumerable, innumerate, <laughs> innumerable hmm. points of order. Or parliamentary inquiries directed mm. at Senator Patty Murray. Okay. Who, uh, one of the senators, I can't remember, uh, kept referring to her as uh, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. And Patty Murray kept correcting him and say, it's Madam President. Yeah, what's wrong with Sir? you? Why are you using the wrong pronoun? Because he was reading oh, well, from a wonder. script. And there you have your candidate in the box who can't adjust the things on the fly. <laughs> and so Patty Murray uh, corrected him, and he still couldn't get it because it was still written in front of him. So he understand. still read what was there. Yeah. No, I didn't understand a Madam President anyway. What do you mean, Madam President? Anyway. So Patty Murray gets to say, no, that's not – what do they say? Excuse me. They don't say it's germane in this case. That's for that uh, right. that that uh, uh, Robert Byrd budget bath. Uh, that thing. Okay, yes. What they say is that it's dilatory. Ah, it is. What's the difference? I don't know. You explain it. Uh, dilatory, well, yeah. Uh, germaneness is a test you're supposed to be able to pass, right? And and uh, sometimes germaneness comes up in, in the context of offering amendments. It, it, it does happen, especially under cloture, uh, which I don't think we're operating under here. But dilatory, when they just say, well, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. It's it's made for You're delay that's what time. dilatory means i mean yeah yeah right and uh, uh, this is not who do you a, think you it's are it's in the a form of a real motion right this has all got the right words to be a motion but uh, ultimately it doesn't result in anything or it's the same substantively as the one that was just rejected doing it over again but with different words is dilatory and i won't entertain it you no longer have the floor so here's the deal GOP hardliners don't want to agree to a 90-minute time limit with debate, which people like Mitt Romney say they want to have. Mm -hmm. I, I can be okay with dismissing this, but I want to debate it first. The hardliners mm -hmm. don't want that because they feel that if they agree to anything with Democrats whatsoever, mm -hmm. they're helping okay. Schumer get rid of these impeachment articles. I see. And so they won't do it. So they won't cooperate. Yeah. So there you have the GOP in a nutshell. And that's what happens in the House. Yeah. The House hardliners don't want to cooperate with uh, anything that the speaker's doing because it would be, quote, a win for the Democrats, end quote. Mm. What would be a win for the Democrats? Anything. Anything yeah. that passes is a win for the Democrats in their view. And now you have GOP hardliners in the Senate taking the same tack. It's just amazing. So you have uh, Republicans in disarray. They don't know what they want. They can't get what they want, so they don't know what they want for a plan B mm, in regard right. to the Mayorkas impeachment. And it's going to play out in the Senate today, and it's going to be Republicans divided. And again, theme of the show today for me, the Republican Party is not a monolith. Yeah. We're seeing it play out in the House, in the Senate, in the states, 
and we're going to see it in the fall. I guess so. Fantastic. It's all right with me. And uh, it's it's working great. Yeah, oh. it's working great. How's it going for you, Mike Johnson? <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Uh, Who was speaker before Mike Johnson? Uh, real speaker or yeah, the interim speaker. one? Uh, uh, Did they have one? Yeah, I think. Oh. Right? McCart- McCart- Paul McCartney, I believe. Paul McCartney. Well, who was after Paul McCartney? Uh, uh, was well, it McHenry and yeah. then Johnson? Yeah, I think so. Or was there anybody in the middle there? No, I don't think so. There was Scalise, but then he had to pull out. Oh no! Well, he was running, but he didn't. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't win, and he wasn't going to win. So Scalise just stayed where he was, I think. Right. I mean, these guys are such non-entities; you don't even know. Yeah. Well, that's true. You have uh, to go look it up. Was was wasn't there somebody else? No, there wasn't anybody no. else. I think that was that was just it. Patrick Mahenry. Yeah. That's it. Mahoney, Mahiha, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somebody. I don't know. <laughs> doesn't Ronald McDonald was Let's right. See. <laughs> Paul, Paul McCartney and then Jerry Mahoney and then uh, and then who do we have now? Oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, one of the Johnsons from uh, Blazing Saddles. I guess Was so. it Howard Johnson? <laughs> Olson and Johnson? Johnson and Johnson. Don't really know. Yeah, this is a guy's name. Johnson N. Johnson. He's Navin Johnson could have been. Yeah, Johnson, right. Johnson, Nevin Johnson. Johnson and Johnson. Uh, the... Um, yeah. Oh, I took a look, by the way. There's a picture of the House managers walking the impeachment resolutions over to uh, articles over to the Senate. Do they wear robes like at graduation? Uh, <laughs> no, but they make a whole they do a march. So they should. They should give them some robes. There's a mace. They could give them the House mace. And say you're walking it over. I was now, curious. They trust them with an implement. They have to wear oh, yeah. January 6th. That's right. That's true. Good point. Uh, so murder Trader green, she, and she didn't dress normal, like a normal member of Congress, but she didn't wear anything weird or, or the, uh, QAnon hat or anything. It'd be uh, fun if she dressed like Kirsten Cinema. Yeah. Well, maybe she did. I don't know. She's in some kind of sleeveless, you know, or, I don't know, you know what, like Wilma Flintstone. Or, or Miss getup. Frizzle from the Magic School Bus. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, any number of options, but she did do it kind of low key. Uh, I haven't seen whether she actually read any of the articles or not. But, and they included her. I thought they might kick her out. but We don't uh, know what the Senate will do, but we'll talk about it tomorrow. Yeah, we'll get a chance. All right, great. Thanks. And uh, sounds like you're doing great. Voice held up nicely today. So yeah, that's good to see. Yeah, finally getting better, I think. Yeah, all right. That's a I good didn't sign. have to hit the mute button to cough nearly as much. But we'll, take we'll it. try it again tomorrow. We'll see okay, see you then. All right, welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So I think the answer, by the way, to uh, where is the chirping smoke alarm, it's got to be in my house. Uh, Greg was not able to detect it, and I think I just heard it again, and Greg's gone. So that's definitely, uh, that is the answer. The problem is that I uh, already fixed that yesterday, and it would thank- thankfully it, stay- it stayed quiet uh, overnight, although maybe it was just in a place that I wouldn't have heard it. But I didn't hear it earlier this morning before the show. It waited until the show was on to start making its stupid chirp noise. I maybe during the next break I'll be able to go press a button and see if I can keep it quiet. Anyway, uh, taking a look at Politico's coverage of the Mayorkas impeachment happenings yesterday, I do, it doesn't look to me like there's any additional information that you need to know because nothing has happened yet, and everybody's just sort of waiting for the process to play itself out. But I'll include the Politico article because it's got the picture of the house managers making the walk over and uh, you can evaluate the outfits that people are wearing. Of course, no one has anything to say about what the men are wearing, but that's because they wear relatively standard uniform, the dark suit and tie, although lots of them wear their ties too long because of Trump. And there's only one other woman in the processional here, I don't know who the house managers are uh, other than Murder Trader Green, but uh, we could look it up and then we would find out the name of this other woman that nobody knows and has never heard of before who's walking at the back of the procession and dressed in conventional style with a sort of a jacket over a blouse as opposed to the bare armed style, which, as you may recall, uh, when Michelle Obama used it was a horrible, horrible thing and meant she was a communist. But when Murder Trader Green does it, it's awesome and loves America. 
So, uh, all right. Let's see. Other things to add. Yeah, yes, Greg knows if I hear chirping now. Now we know it's not you. Uh, it is It is here. Uh, the funny thing was if you when I spent time during one of the break, I took my headphones off and said, well, let me listen. If I can hear it without the headphones on, then I know it's from here. And as soon as I took the headphones off, it stopped. So the cure is take off the headphones, but then I won't be able to hear what I'm doing for the show. Okay, let's see. Other fun things that uh, perhaps might be of interest to you besides the chirping. Let's see. Um, hmm. Well, there were hearings yesterday before the Supreme Court about the presidential immunity question. So maybe we ought to get caught up on what happened there. And we could read the explainer, which is endorsed by Mark Elias from the Democracy Docket. And, uh, of course, it's also endorsed because it's published at the Democracy Docket, though written by Rachel Selzer, whom... Mark says did a pretty good job explaining an excellent job, probably is what he said, explaining the proceedings. And there were some questions about, well, you know, where are the conservative justices who you think are going to want to come down if they can in a way that saves Trump, but probably also looking to look non crazy when they do it. And there's just no way to really land there. So. Uh, let's see. If Mark liked it, well, Mark isn't being totally objective here because this is published at his place. But we'll take his word for it because he kind of knows what's going on in the world. Trump's presidential immunity argument explained. Let's see what Rachel has to say about it. It doesn't look like overly long. So good for us. And uh, we'll see how many chirps it takes to get through this thing. On numerous occasions, former President Donald Trump has proclaimed that he is above the law even going so far as to remark during his 2016 campaign that he could, quote, stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody. Oh, uh, I forgot his voice. And wouldn't lose any voters. Decades earlier, former President Richard Nixon, who ultimately resigned after being embroiled in the infamous White uh, Watergate scandal, told a reporter that when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Although Trump is not the first to invoke the concept of presidential immunity, he is the first to test the argument, I guess you could call it that, as a defense in a criminal case against a former president. Following an upcoming oral argument arising from Trump's federal election subversion indictment, and that's what the actual indictment is in the so-called hush money case, so well done there. The U.S. Supreme Court will decide on the question of whether a former president enjoys absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct while in office. The Supreme Court has previously ruled on presidential immunity in the context of civil lawsuits. That is true. Everyone remembers why and how. However, given that no former president was ever prosecuted prior to Trump, the court has never waded into whether such immunity shields a president from criminal liability. Below, we at Democracy Docket explain the history of the Supreme Court's presidential immunity doctrine and how Trump is employing a sweeping claim of presidential immunity to argue that he cannot be prosecuted for allegedly attempting to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Well, what is presidential immunity? Well, it's a limited slip differential that distributes power equally between the right and the left rear tires. Everyone knows that. Uh, how has the Supreme Court applied it in past cases? Here's the real answer. Uh, although I'm beginning to feel like I'm sure this is an excellent explanation, but I also feel like maybe we have already explained it. But uh, I'm hoping for more out of this. Presidential immunity is a legal doctrine that shields sitting and former presidents from legal accountability in certain cases. Although presidential immunity is not directly mentioned in the text of the U.S. Constitution, so textualists should hate it, right? The doctrine has evolved throughout a series of court rulings over the last few decades. In past cases, the Supreme Court has applied presidential immunity to shield presidents from liability in civil lawsuits pertaining to their official conduct while in office but it has declined to extend the doctrine to the unofficial private conduct. In its 1981 decision, Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court held that former President Nixon was absolutely immune 
from private civil lawsuits concerning his official presidential responsibilities. The official conduct at issue in that particular case involved Nixon's allegedly retaliatory firing of a U.S. Air Force employee who asserted that he was wrongly dismissed for his whistleblowing testimony before Congress. The court considered Nixon's firing of an employee to be official conduct that falls within the outer perimeter or broadest possible scope of a president's official actions. The court in Fitzgerald premised the need for presidential immunity from civil liability on the basis that these suits could distract the president from performing his job, which is interesting because there was no way to distract Donald Trump from doing his job because he was never doing it. His whole presidency was distractions from doing his job. So I don't think that's a real thing you can use to convince them. Well, just because the president was horrible at the job probably doesn't obviate the the concept of presidential immunity for official conduct. But uh, the threat of civil liability, as they were saying, the majority held, could have a chilling effect on a president's decision-making abilities by rendering him unduly cautious. Nevertheless, the court acknowledged that such immunity does not cover criminal cases, noting that there is a lesser public interest in actions for civil damages than there would be, for example, in criminal prosecutions. So, right, so in other words, yes, uh, these things may distract him from his job, and we don't want the president distracted from his job over an issue of civil litigation civil litigation is important but it's not so important that we can uh that we would say we'd rather have a distracted president so that civil justice gets done which it's a sacrifice we're willing to make in order to keep the presidency effective but there's a greater interest public interest in criminal proceedings against anybody that's a much more serious thing and the balance as between well should we allow a president to just maybe get away with crimes or should we settle this question is that worth distracting the president with well yeah it probably would be uh except of course well the real problem is that uh, trump would argue well then i'd be criminally charged every day that's ridiculous i'll be so distracted well you know the problem is that, you, well, in, ordin in the ordinary course of things, people don't simply charge the president of the United States with criminal wrongdoing every day just to distract him. Although it's a pretty good indication of what Republicans would plan to do if a Democrat won the White House and they had a functioning majority uh, and could, in fact, charge him with crimes or that a a Republican successor would do that all day long with Joe Biden should Joe Biden uh, either after his term of office is over after I guess what would be his second term uh, but uh, at any rate of course one they have no functioning majority to do that with and two uh, yeah they're giving away the game that's actually every Republican accusation is a confession we plan to do this to every Democratic president that we eventually defeat or replace. Why aren't you? Well, we think you are. Well, okay. Well, we're not. Anyway, nevertheless, right, the court says uh, lesser public interest in actions for civil damages than there are for criminal prosecutions. So, in its 1997 decision in Clinton versus Jones, the Supreme Court held that then President Bill Clinton was not immune from civil lawsuit concerning his private unofficial acts. The underlying case involved allegations of sexual harassment against Clinton over actions taken prior to his presidency. The court maintained that unlike civil cases pertaining to a president's official acts, those concerning private acts would not distract the president from his duties or render him unduly cautious. There's certainly nothing unduly cautious about Bill Clinton. So, in a separate line of cases, the Supreme Court has consistently ruled that presidents are not absolutely shielded from complying with subpoenas issued in ongoing state or federal criminal cases. Criminal cases. Criminal, criminal, criminal. What is Trump arguing in his presidential immunity appeal to the Supreme Court? Well, Trump is arguing that all of the conduct alleged in the Washington, D.C. election subversion case which centers on his efforts to remain in power after losing the 2020 election, perhaps you remember it, constituted official presidential acts for which he is absolutely immune from prosecution. 
Well, in support of this absolute immunity claim, an assertion that was categorically rejected by two other courts, Trump proffers two main arguments. One, the separation of powers doctrine shields him from criminal prosecution. Right, The executives cannot be subject to prosecution by the judiciary. And two, the U.S. Con- or, or, or maybe I guess he might also be saying separation of powers uh, and unitary executive uh, the, the theory that grows out of it, that the executive power belongs to him and the Department of Justice can't prosecute him as a member of the same branch. But I don't think that's what he's saying here. Two, though, that the U.S. Constitution's impeachment judgments clause renders a president absolutely immune from criminal liability unless he is first convicted by the U.S. Senate following an impeachment proceeding, which is an understanding that no one has ever held about impeachment at all. And in fact, they have believed the exact opposite, that it's okay, and it was argued by Republicans during Trump's impeachment trial, that they ought not to feel bound by the notion that they needed to convict the president in the impeachment setting because, after all, if what he did was so bad, he would be subject to criminal prosecution afterwards when he was no longer in office. With regard to his separation of powers justification, Trump argues, now we can actually hear it, that courts cannot, quote, sit in criminal judgment over a president's official actions even after he leaves office. The, well, when he's no longer the unitary executive. I don't know. Why not? The U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit previously rejected this argument because it doesn't make any sense. Ruling in a unanimous February 2024 opinion that Trump does not have the authority to defy federal criminal law and is therefore answerable in court for his conduct. The D.C. Circuit further concluded that in contrast to civil lawsuits concerning a president's official acts, the public interest in holding a president criminally accountable outweighs the potential risks of chilling presidential action. Trump's other main argument in support of his absolute immunity defense hinges on his reading of the impeachment judgments clause, which or under which he argues that a president may only be subject to criminal prosecution if he is first impeached by the U.S. House, which he was, and subsequently convicted by the U.S. Senate, which he was not. And remember, he was not convicted on the basis, as uh, the argument was presented then and there, that day in front of everyone, on the basis that, well, we don't need to do this because he's still criminally liable afterwards. So talk about having your cake and eating it, too. In turn, Trump also contends that a president who is acquitted by the U.S. Senate cannot later be indicted for similar conduct. The D.C. Circuit rebuffed what is deemed as Trump's tortured and a historical reading of the impeachment judgments clause, explaining that the clause's inclusion of the word convicted doesn't implicitly bestow immunity on presidents who are not convicted. The court also underscored the fact that that while the framers carved out immunity for certain elected officials in other areas of the Constitution, such as in the speech and debate clause, they chose not to include a similar provision granting immunity to the president. What a strange idea. Now, what could happen after the Supreme Court's ruling on Trump's immunity appeal? Let's wind it up. In addition to directly impacting Trump's federal election subversion case brought by Special Counsel Jack Smith, the Supreme Court's eventual ruling on presidential immunity could also affect the other ongoing criminal suits against the former president, especially those in Florida and Georgia that have not yet gone to trial. Trump's appeal has already delayed and temporarily halted proceedings in the election subversion case, which was originally scheduled to go to trial on March 4th this year. If the court fully affirms the D.C. Circuit's ruling that Trump is not absolutely immune from criminal prosecution, which they really should, but who knows, the case will then go back down to the district court and proceed to trial. Conversely, the court could hold that Trump is absolutely or partially immune from criminal liability for his in-office acts. However, even if the court rules that Trump is immune for certain official acts outlined in his indictment, a trial could still take place regarding Trump's allegedly unofficial private conduct involving his attempts to overturn the 2020 election. 
and that could be an issue at trial. Which which acts are which? Which ones are official? Which ones are unofficial? And is there a gray area even in between? So, all right. Well, that lays things out anyway. And because they were arguing this in front of the Supreme Court, we have to acknowledge it. I did see some reporting that there were some questions that indicated some skepticism from the uh, conservative justices about uh, whether or not, uh, you know, the, the definition of official act was as clear as people were saying. Of course, they were also hearing about they're also hearing about uh, the uh, constitutionality of some of the charges brought against January 6th rioters as well. So lots of opportunity for mischief if they really just want to be purely shameless. But mm, it, it's hard to tell where they're going to come down on that. Uh, let's see. Other things here that uh, require some discussion. And I guess maybe we should... Uh, Read them into the record here. Oh, by the way, I need to check out. What have I parked here for myself uh, from Twitter on this one? Oh, yes, right. Um, actually, we dealt with this one yesterday. This was the Thomas Massey saying that he was going to join in support of the motion to uh, vacate the chair, which Greg rightly pointed out. Eh, you don't need any co-sponsors for that, so who cares? This, another um, happening before the Supreme Court, which probably warrants some attention as well. Reported on by Vox's Ian Milheiser, who always has a pretty good eye for these things. And this is an important one, too. The Supreme Court has effectively, as he says, abolished the right to mass protest in three U.S. states. How did that happen? Uh, the subheader hints at which states here. Well, it doesn't hint at it. It tells you outright. It is no longer safe to organize a protest in Louisiana, Mississippi, or Texas. Why those three states? Because those three states are covered by... Uh, I'll, I'll pose the question if you didn't guess where I was going. It's covered by the blank circuit court of appeals. Give me the uh, ordinal number there. What The fifth circuit, right the one where they always go judge shopping and find one uh, lone judge in one or of, uh, a few district courts who will give them exactly what they want. And in this case, it is the right to threaten certain types of people who organize certain types of protests. But if you're of a different and favorable kind, maybe they won't do it. Uh, we'll talk about how that shakes out in just a minute here. All right, so Ian Milheiser explains what's going on here. The Supreme Court announced on Monday that it will not hear the case of McKesson versus Doe. The decision not to hear McKesson leaves in place a lower court decision that effectively eliminated the right to organize a mass protest in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. How does that happen? I'm sure I'll explain it later if they agree uh, or if they decide not to hear a case that leaves in place the uh, effectiveness of the decision below. The decision below the Supreme Court is almost always coming from one of the circuit courts of appeal. In this case, it's the Fifth Circuit. So what it means is the Fifth Circuit so far has decided that you, uh, well, we'll find out what they decided, but whatever they decided, we know already would be the state of the law in the states that are encompassed by the Fifth Circuit, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. Under that lower court decision, a protest organizer faces potentially ruinous financial consequences if a single attendee at a mass protest commits an illegal act. Now, it's possible that this outcome will be temporary. The court did not embrace the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit's decision attacking the First Amendment right to protest, but it didn't reverse it either. And that means that, at least for now, the Fifth Circuit's decision is the law in much of the American South. Now, the facts behind the case for the past several years, the Fifth Circuit is engaged has engaged in a crusade against DeRay McKesson, that's the McKesson we're talking about here, a prominent figure within the Black Lives Matter movement who organized a protest near a Baton Rouge police station in 2016. Many of you know 
DeRay McKesson or who he is and are familiar with his work. He's the McKesson at the heart of this case. The facts of the McKesson case are, unfortunately, quite tragic. McKesson helped organize the Baton Rouge protest following the fatal police shooting of Alton Sterling. You know, that's what you do after another one of these police shootings. You organize a protest, as is your right. Now, during that protest, an unknown individual threw a rock or similar object at a police officer, the plaintiff in the McKesson case, who was identified only as Officer John Doe, because of how brave he is. Sadly, the officer was struck in the face and, according to one court, suffered injuries to his teeth, jaw, brain, and head. And teeth, jaw, and brain, of course, all component parts of the head, but you understand, this is serious. He was injured. Everyone agrees that this rock was not thrown by McKesson. However, or rather, I should say, uh, it was not thrown by McKesson, however. But, however, it doesn't matter because he's been embroiled in court ever since. And the U.S. Supreme Court held in NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware, a 1982 case, that protest leaders cannot be held liable for the violent actions of a protest participant absent unusual circumstances that are not present in the McKesson case, such as, for instance, if McKesson had authorized, directed, or ratified the decision to throw the rock. Indeed, as just so, you know, what are we doing here, right? As Justice Sonia Sotomayor points out in a brief opinion accompanying the court's decision not to hear McKesson, the court recently affirmed the strong First Amendment protections enjoyed by people like McKesson in Counterman versus Colorado. That decision held that the First Amendment precludes punishment for inciting violent action unless the speaker's words were intended, not just likely, but intended to produce imminent disorder. Can you think of anybody who might be doing that? The reason Claiborne protects against organizers should be, or protects organizers rather, not against organizers, protects organizers should be obvious. No one who organizes a mass event attended by thousands of people can possibly control the actions of all those attendees, regardless of whether the event is a political protest, a music concert, or the Super Bowl. So, if protest organizers can be sanctioned for the illegal action of any protest attendee, no one in their right mind would ever organize a political protest again. Not only that, but of course, uh, Proud Boys could show up at any political protest and punch someone in the face and you end up suing the organizer and that's okay. Who's going to organize? Indeed, a Fifth Circuit or as Fifth Circuit Judge Don Willett, remember him, who dissented from his court's McKesson decision, warned in one of his dissents, the court's decision would make protest organizers liable for the unlawful acts of counter-protesters and agitators. So, under the Fifth Circuit's rule, a Ku Klux Klansman could sabotage the Black Lives Matter movement simply by showing up at its protests and throwing stones. Just what we said. The Fifth Circuit's McKesson decision, Ian says, is obviously wrong. Like McKesson, Claiborne involved a racial justice protest that included some violent participants. In the mid-1960s, the NAACP launched a boycott of white merchants in Claiborne County, Mississippi. At least according to the state Supreme Court, some participants in this boycott engaged in acts of physical force and violence against the persons and property of certain customers and prospective customers of these white businesses. Indeed, one of the organizers of this boycott did far more to encourage violence than McKesson is accused of in his case. Charles Evers, a local NAACP leader, allegedly said in a speech to boycott supporters that if we catch any of you going in any of them racist stores, we're going to break your damn neck. Well, yeah, okay. But the Supreme Court held that this emotionally charged rhetoric did not transcend the bounds of protected speech. It ruled the courts must use extreme care, extreme care, before imposing liability on any political, a political figure of any kind. And it held that a protest leader may only be held liable for a protest participants actions under very limited circumstances and the quote 
uh, here tells us what they're about. There are three separate theories that might justify, might justify holding Evers liable for the unlawful conduct of others. First, a finding that he authorized, directed, or ratified specific tortious activity would justly justify holding him responsible for the consequences of that activity. Okay. Second, a finding that his public speeches were likely to incite lawless action could justify holding him liable for unlawful conduct that, in fact, followed within a reasonable period. And then third, the speeches might be taken as evidence that Evers gave others specific instructions to carry out violent acts or threats. Well, okay, we understand what those three conditions are. Are any of them present in the McKesson case? Well, you want to take a guess at that? And we'll be right back and see what we can do about the chirping next. Sup, fam? It's your boy Darwin, a.k.a. Darwin underscore Darko, a.k.a. the most reasonable man in America, a.k.a. KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and We Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegor in the Morning Show here on at Roots Radio. I think we might have gotten a respite from the chirping, but I think I'm going to have to replace that one, that smoke alarm, I guess. Uh, there seems to be nothing I can do about it. I replaced the battery yesterday. As a matter of fact, I tested the battery that was in there before, and the battery tester says it's still good. But it was unhappy with it, so I replaced the battery, and now I'm only wasting another battery that's uh, good, I guess. And maybe the unit is malfunctioning or something. Anyway, so I hit the button. We got a loud blast and then uh, no chirps. I think that can get us through the end of the show, but uh, after that, we'll just have to see what we can do. Now we actually have birds chirping instead and that's a lot more pleasant but that happening directly outside the window as well so there's going to be chirping no matter what so where were we we had just laid out or quoted the court from the um evers case right was that it what what was the uh title of that uh case that we were reading claiborne right okay and the three uh elements that might if present lead a court to be able to rule that the liability should attach to a protest organizer. There has to be authorized, directed, or ratified specific tortious activity or public speeches that are likely to incite lawless action or third, speeches that might be taken as evidence that a speaker gave other specific instructions to carry out violent acts or threats. The Fifth Circuit concluded in a 2019 opinion that Officer Doe, in the McKesson case, has not pled facts that would allow a jury to conclude that McKesson colluded with the unknown assailant to attack Officer Doe, knew of the attack and ratified it, or agreed with other named persons that attacking the police was one of the goals of the demonstration. So that should have been the end of the case. Instead... Why not? Why not just continue with the case? In its most recent opinion on this case, the Fifth Circuit concluded that Claiborne's three separate theories that might justify holding a protest leader liable are a non-exhaustive list and that the MAGA-infused court is allowed to create new exceptions to the First Amendment. Well, that's really something. 
Why bother with the three listed elements that might allow for liability that were laid out by the Supreme Court when you could list a fourth? Sure, it doesn't meet any of these three, but what if we made up another one? Well, you're not really supposed to be able to do that, but uh, I guess uh, let's see where you're going with this. I mean, I, I would have said, no, you're not, but well, not allowed to, but they went ahead and did it anyway, because what are we going to do about it? Uh, okay, so what happened? Well, let's see. It ruled, after deciding that they could create a new exception, that the First Amendment does not apply quote, where a defendant creates unreasonably dangerous conditions and where his creation of those conditions causes a plaintiff to sustain injuries. Huh. Well, now, it's not a formulation I necessarily disagree with, but it's not one that appears to fit the facts either. Ian asks, what exactly were the unreasonably dangerous conditions created by the McKesson-led protest in Baton Rouge? The Fifth Circuit faulted McKesson for organizing the protest to begin in front of the police station, obstructing access to the building. That's the unreasonably dangerous thing. What's so unreasonably dangerous about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, what if you had an emergency and you had to get to the police station and you couldn't because they were blocked by protesters? I don't know. You could call them? Hmm. Okay, well, but besides that, what else could you do? See, that's unreasonably dangerous. You couldn't get in if you wanted to. So, hmm. Okay. So, oh, also, by the way, uh, he also is cited here for failing to dissuade protesters who had allegedly stolen water bottles from a grocery store. Okay. And then for leading the assembled protest onto a public highway in violation of Louisiana criminal law. Needless to say, the idea that the First Amendment recedes the moment a mass protest violates a traffic law is quite novel, and it is impossible to reconcile with pretty much the entire history of mass civil rights protests in the United States, except insofar as white conservative people wanted to be able to outlaw them, and now they have. In fairness, the court's decision to leave the Fifth Circuit's attack on the First Amendment in place could be temporary, as Sotomayor writes in her McKesson opinion, when the court announces that it will not hear a particular case, it expresses no view about the merits. The court could still restore the First Amendment right to protest in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas in a future case. For the time being, however... The Fifth Circuit's McKesson decision remains good law in those three states, and that means that anyone who organizes a political protest within the Fifth Circuit risks catastrophic financial liability. So that seems unsustainable, uh, but while it's being sustained, I guess now the question is, will libs of TikTok, higher rate inspire some sort of protest violence in any of the states covered by the Fifth Circuit. Uh, and then after that, of course, the question of will the Fifth Circuit in, in an act of blatant hypocrisy just decide that she's not to be held liable based on something else that they're going to invent? And well, in all likelihood, sure, that's exactly what they'll do. Anyway, so it's very important in that sense uh, to remember that that appears to be the next upcoming hypocrisy uh, uh, fostered by the uh, Republican conservative movement in the courts. All right. Let's see other things that we wanted to share with you. Uh, oh, in the legal context. Well, let's see. Uh, this one. Well, let me take a look and see who shared this one with me. I think it came in through email. Ah, yes, right. Jeremy Freiberger sent me this thing here, which, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's uh, courtroom related. So in that sense, we should catch up on the various developments. Smartmatic and the MAGA OAN television network have settled their election defamation case. Justin Barragona reporting for the Daily Beast on this one. The far-right network was initially sued by 
the voting software firm for pushing baseless conspiracy theories that the 2020 presidential election was rigged against Donald Trump. Rigged. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just like, uh, what was it, Dominion voting systems got their big payday, I guess there's, I, I presume there's one in the offing from this settlement for Smartmatic, but they don't uh, go to trial as a result. Voting software firm Smartmatic and pro-Trump conspiracy network One America News have reached a confidential settlement in the defamation lawsuit accusing OAN of peddling lies about the 2020 presidential election. The dismissal of the complaint was filed in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia on Tuesday. The case has been resolved pursuant to a confidential agreement OAN attorney Chip Babcock said about the settlement. Smartmatic has resolved its litigation against OANN through a confidential settlement. Smartmatic lawyer Eric Connolly noted in a statement. So, okay. Tells us nothing. Um, I don't think they're going to say anything about it either. The agreement between Smartmatic and OAN comes almost a full year after Dominion Voting Systems, another voting technology company, was paid an eye-popping $787.5 million dollars to settle its defamation lawsuit against Fox News. So all these things are ending in settlement, which is, you know, uh, not unusual. And then, of course, once you get a settlement like that, uh, it tends to move other people to settlement as well because they're afraid of what might happen to them if they continue to judgment. Um, Let's see. Smartmatic, along with Dominion, was also caught up in Trump world's conspiracy theories about voting machines stealing millions of votes for Joe Biden, which, of course, was baloney from the start. In November 2021, Smartmatic sued OAN and Newsmax. The company had already filed a $2.7 billion complaint against Fox News. Several of its hosts and numerous Trump associates in February of 2021, Fox News would incidentally part ways with Trump boosting host Lou Dobbs the day after Smartmatic filed its lawsuit. While the company has reached a settlement with OAN, the company still has pending lawsuits against Fox News, Newsmax, and several other Trump allies. In its lawsuit against OAN, which gleefully promoted false claims about rigged voting machines and widespread election fraud, Smartmatic said that the Little Watch Network victimized the company by spreading false information about the election and their efforts to increase viewership and revenue. The damage to Smartmatic from this parallel universe of lies and disinformation has reverberated across the United States and in dozens of countries around the world. Smartmatic CEO Antonio Mujica, Mujica, M-U-G-I-C-A, you tell me, said at the time, the global repercussions for our company cannot be overstated. In fact, the global repercussions for people who aren't even involved in that company at all, the rest of us who have to live under this democracy and other democracies around the world, were damaged and cannot be, the damages cannot be overstated. I say that in the context, by the way, of just to depart from the story for a moment, the effort by the major news outlets to coerce or to co to coax, I guess I shouldn't say, not coerce, but to coax uh, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden into participating in at least one televised presidential debate during the upcoming uh, campaign, which ordinarily you would say is an essential part of a campaign, but at this point you could now dismiss as useless and even counterproductive. Donald Trump isn't going to debate Biden, even if you do put them on a stage and tell them to do so. And it should be pointed out that Donald Trump will spend as much time, if not more time, debating the news outlets that sponsored the debate than he does uh, with Joe Biden. He'll simply use every minute they offer him for free, uh, prime time on network television, to launch more ridiculous conspiracy theories uh, about Biden, about himself, what have you, and poison the 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 body politic using free airtime from the networks who encouraged him to come on because we need to find out you know substantive policy positions as between him and Joe Biden but instead you'll get him coming out and saying and they they're vampire pedophiles and he kidnaps the children he kidnaps the children he drinks their blood and becomes uh, immortal that's what happens. You can you ask yourself, you know, take a look at, take a look at, take a look at how the blood is being 
drained from the children underneath the pizza, underneath the pizza they're having at the Comet Pizza, you know, whatever. It, I, all he has to do is spew that stuff. And, of course, the networks say, well, our, our moderators will say, oh, what's your evidence for that? And, and, and that'll undo the whole thing. This is going to be televised around the world. He'll just, uh, you know, Joe Biden, he's a crook, he's a criminal. He takes the money from the Burisma, like Hunter Biden, as the laptop proves. But no, they're covering it up. It's a terrible thing because they're vampires. And all, it, that's what will happen. What, are you telling me the, the, the moderators have a way to undo that? No, Mr. Trump, that's just... <laughs> so offer him that time, offer him that space. You're responsible. I think the McKesson case tells us, for as a matter of fact, why not? We'll extend the McKesson case. If people in the United States or anywhere in the world, indeed, begin to believe any of the stupid lies that Donald Trump spews during one of those debates, you're financially liable for it. Are you going to host the debate? No? Well, then I think we've come to a satisfactory conclusion here. Let's just announce that you should be held uh, financially liable for the damages that we all suffer if you give Trump airtime to launch a primetime attack of his of his choosing against anybody. And then we'll see whether you really think it's worth the ad revenue and or the clicks that you think are going to make you the money here. You want to do this because you th- as everybody has pointed out, you want to make money with these debates. All right. Well, if you end up doing damage to the body politic with it, we'll disgorge that money from you and take it back and award it to the state. Still interested? I didn't think so. Anyway, back to this article about what happened with Smartmatic. Uh, Just a reminder of some of the names that were involved here. The network wasn't just pushing those election lies on its airwaves on its airwaves, I guess, either. Christina Bob, then an OAN host, worked with then-Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani on Trump's efforts to overturn the election while she was still anchoring a network show. In fact, in a 2021 deposition, Giuliani claimed that the Trump campaign had veto power over Bob's OAN stories, which, by the way, I don't know whether they had at any point, did OAN have any uh, passes to the congressional press galleries. I'm just curious about that because as many of you longtime listeners will recall, uh, at one point when working for Daily Coast, I applied for the same passes and was told by the governing board of the, uh, the, the press galleries that, no, you, you guys are too partisan. We can't let you in. I'd be fascinated to know whether OAN has any passes, and maybe that's something we can look up at some point. Production assistants, get on it. The settlement between OAN and Smartmatic comes months after the voting software firm accused OAN executives of soliciting stolen passwords of Smartmatic employees and forwarding them on to ex-Trump campaign lawyer Sidney Powell and an election-denying... <laughs> The phrase I'm about to read. <laughs> All right. So they, you know who I'm talking about, too. It won't grab you by surprise, but it's just I've never seen it put this way before. They accused OAN executives of soliciting stolen passwords of Smartmatic employees and forwarding them on. To who? To ex-Trump campaign lawyer Sidney Powell. Dun, dun, dun. And election-denying pillow salesman <laughs> Mike Lindell. That's what he is. It shouldn't surprise me that way, but I've never seen it put quite that way. Well, Lindell and Powell, who have been both been sued by Dominion and Smartmatic, were two of the most prominent purveyors of election fraud conspiracy theories following Trump's loss. This isn't the first defamation lawsuit tied to the 2020 election lies that the conspiratorial network has settled, by the way. Last September, for instance, OAN and its star correspondent Chanel Rion, remember her, reached a settlement with former Dominion executive Eric Coomer, whom they accused of working uh, in concert with Antifa activists to rig the election against Trump. Wow. Additionally, in May of 2022, OAN publicly admitted that there was, quote, no widespread voter fraud in Georgia or anywhere else, really. But that's what they admitted in Georgia didn't happen. After reaching a settlement with two of the state's election workers who had been falsely accused by the channel, of engaging in ballot fraud. 
OAN's extreme programming, promotion of unhinged conspiracy theories, and cartoonish Trump sycophancy. Sick, uh, how do we? Uh, I've lost the the thread on how you pronounce sycophant uh, activity. Sycophancy. Sick. <laughs> well, do the British pronounce it weirdly in any possible? Is that any excuse? You yeah, sick, sick of fancy. <laughs> oh, I can't do it. My brain isn't working anymore. It was broken by the election denying pillow salesman. Well, you know what we're talking about. Anyway, that has all resulted in the channel being almost completely unavailable on cable and satellite providers. Hooray. After its parent company, AT&T, largely propped up the ultra conservative channel for four years. We should punish them for that. DirecTV dropped the truth defying network from its airwaves in early of 20. Uh, early 2022. Since then, other pay TV carriers have distanced themselves from the network, leaving the channel in dire financial straits and teetering on the edge of extinction, which is terrific. That's uh, good news. All right, let's see. Eh, what up next? Eh, what shall we choose to uh, feature? Or which direction do we want to go? Oh, you know, maybe I'll read you the thing that I was going to read yesterday. I just sort of dropped it as a, well, you'll never believe this one sort of story uh, about, and where did we decide this one came from? Mark D. Hamill, who I think sent us this local item, accused Holyoke ex-counselor Pueo Mota bolts to join the Russian army. I've seen it in a number of other outlets since then, but this from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and now this is my last free article, so boy, oh boy, there better not be any more breaking news in the Daily Hampshire Gazette for the rest of the month. Uh, James Pentland had written this piece, and it was unbelievable, and we only got to, I mean, we got the gist of it out, but holy cow. A one-term Holyoke City Councilor, and now member of the Honorary Republican Squad online, who appears to have decamped to fight with Russian forces in the Ukraine war, in order to avoid having to register here as a sex offender, has unsurprisingly become the focus of national and international media coverage. Wilmer, really, that's some name, Wilmer Pueo Mota, 28, this young man has accomplished so much in such a short amount of time, was due to change his plea to child porn possession and other charges in a Rhode Island court in January when his lawyer learned that he had left the country. He said, I joined the Russian army or something like that. Attorney John M. Is it, uh, it's, oh, it's, uh, is he part of the same family in Rhode Island? Sicilini. Is that right? How they, how did we decide how that was going to be? Or is it Sicilini still? Dang. Uh, there's only one C and I never did. Well, I probably did settle it at some point and then forgot because it's one of those things. Once you get in your head that you're confused about the pronunciation of something, forget it. Anyway. Uh, I wonder, is he related to the former congressman? Well, at any rate, uh, that's what he says. I got, I got a note. Said, I joined the Russian army or something like that. I thought he was joking. And who could blame him? Cicilline, uh declined to comment to the Gazette, but he told the Globe that he was sure his client left the country because he didn't want to have to register as a sex offender. And he didn't believe that he had a future in the United States. And it should nor ordinarily be difficult to imagine a future for yourself in the United States if you're having to register as a sex offender on child porn charges. But don't forget, he was a Republican elected official. I think you can kind of get away with just about anything eventually. But maybe at 28, it's difficult to believe that. The plea agreement with prosecutors required Pueo Mota to plead guilty to all charges in exchange for an 18-month prison term and registering as a sex offender, according to his attorney. A video widely circulated online shows Pueo Mota entering and being interviewed at a Russian army enlistment center. He videoed it. Why? Well, maybe the Russians videoed it. Uh, he says he feels lucky to have met up with people from the International Brigade, a combat unit of mostly Serbian forces, which is very interesting. And I do wonder occasionally uh, things like uh, what will presumably ultra conservative Serbian mercenaries essentially think of having a child porn guy in their midst? Uh, 
I wonder if he will die of a wound from the from someone behind him, the rear echelons, perhaps. I don't know. They may he may fit in wonderfully. They may all be uh, perverts on the run. I don't know. You know, we did our work. We did our job. We did what we were supposed to do. I definitely would do it again. He says in on the video. To who? About what? I don't know, but that's what he says. Later, he says he had been made to feel most welcome in Russia. I guess they they love pervs. The social support has been absolutely fantastic from the moment I got here. He says, this is the least I can do is to give back and help. Everyone has been so kind. I mean, what, give back and help. Like when he was in the United States, were the Russians supporting him in his... Uh, child porn case or something? What's he giving back? No, when he got there and said, I'll fight for you in your stupid war that you can't get anybody to join. And, oh, okay. Well, then they supported you. Well, now I, now it's been so nice. They've been so nice and so lovely. I just had to give back. But you, you've already made the exchange here. The video is undated, but it seems to refer to a Ukrainian town that surrendered to Russian forces in February. Uh, what is this town? Avdivka, maybe? A-V-D-I-I-V-K-A. Avdivka. Avdivka, it's terrible. It's sad what happened there. It's a very bad situation, he says. Pueo Mota worked as a staff sergeant with the Massachusetts Air National Guard at Barnes Air Base in Westfield from June of 2019 until October of 2022. Barnes Public Affairs Specialist Jerry Hewitt said on Thursday, by the way, uh, that sort of rings a bell for me, but um, was it the Massachusetts Air National Guard uh, that uh, the uh, the other young man served in, uh, I got, uh, who, who um, was the one sharing classified information uh, on the internet, International Guard. Uh, yeah, Jack Tahera, right? Wasn't he in the? Was he in the? Ma they got a problem in the Massachusetts Air National Guard, I think. Jack Douglas Tahera, uh, yeah, hundred and second Intelligence Wing of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. I, I mean. They may never have come into contact with one of them. Maybe at completely different bases, completely different ends of Massachusetts. I don't know. But people are beginning to ask questions about what we got to close down the Massachusetts Air National Guard until we find out what the hell is going on over there. Just pointing that out. Anyway, he was severed from service because, and this is a quote, because his values did not align with ours. He would say, yeah, I mean... Not all of you, but he might have had something in common with Tahera. Pueo Mota had been charged five months earlier with forging his commander's signature. A lot of forgery happening in Republican circles these days as well. Forging his commander's signature in a misguided bid to resolve his child porn charges without a guilty plea. In Rhode Island, the attorney general acknowledged last month that Pueo Mota had fled the country and joined the Russian military or somehow created the story to hide his whereabouts, according to news reports. Don't, I guess, don't sleep on the idea that he mocked up such a video and forged it. And, I don't know, paid actors. Well, we'll stop looking for him. He's joined the Russian military and is fighting in Ukraine. There's no chance we're ever going to recover him. Let's stop looking. I mean, that would be kind of brilliant. I mean, in an evil way. Uh, hmm. Anyway, uh, officials said at the time that he was believed to be in Istanbul and videos and photos had emerged showing him in Russia and Ukraine, which is not where Istanbul is. But one of the videos showed someone alleged to be Pueo Mota planting a U.S. flag in a Ukrainian city in support of Russian forces. I'm not certain what the messaging is supposed to be there, but the person's face is blurred, but he has been identified by his voice. I'm here to plant the U.S. flag as a sign of friendship and support for all the things people are enduring here, he says. And honestly, having heard his statement, I still can't make out what the message is supposed to be. The Guardian reported last week 
that he had resurfaced at an enlistment center in the Russian region of the Kanti Mansiysk, oh my goodness, in western Siberia. What? Okay, where he was captured on film, signing a military contract, seated in a room adorned with photographs of Vladimir Putin and the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. Oh boy, lots of Russian to have to work with today. There's more, by the way, and we're not going to get to it because we're going to run out of time. But uh, this, the rundown of this guy's accomplishments in his 28 short years on the planet. Uh, Pueyo Moto's legal troubles began in 2020 in Warwick, Rhode Island. Do they say Warwick? After he called police to report that his gun had been stolen at a hotel. So he was a gun fail guy at some point, too. Police later learned that he was there to meet a... 17-year-old girl that he had met online when they searched his phone and found nude photos of the girl. I guess they did meet. And he was charged in January of 2021 with possession of child pornography. So, 17-year-old, but that counts as child pornography. Let's not do that, shall we? Pueyo Mota, who was 24 at the time, told police he believed the girl was 22. The girl allegedly told police that he had sent her money for sexually explicit photos when he knew that she was underage. Sounds like a guy who's currently serving in Congress. And uh, the other guy who's currently not serving in Congress said that he wanted to press ethics charges against him. And guess who got bounced out of Congress? The guy who says he wanted to press the ethics case. How odd. Why would this guy believe that his only route out is joining the Russian army and abandoning life here in the United States? I think uh, the record speaks pretty clearly that you can accomplish great things after being caught with child pornography and uh, and child molestation. Uh, Not that I advocate it. I'm just telling you that's what Republicans appear to be able to get away with in this country. So maybe the whole thing was faked. That would make a terrific movie. EdwardsRadio.com But a terrible reality. You have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. I guess that's where we live, the reality and not the movie. Okay, well, what's up next today? Well, a little bit of a personal schedule hiccup for Justice Putnam, so no new West Coast cookbook and speakeasy coming up next. But, of course, appropriate programming as opposed to the sort of programming that you might get from this guy who just left to join the Russian Army. We'll see you tomorrow.